Welcome, everybody. I'm Carlos del Castillo. I'm a journalist at the Spanish digital newspaper, El Diario.es. And I want to thank you all for joining us in this edition of the Discipline Festival. In this talk, we will approach the similarities and differences of two of the greatest digital phenomena of the last 10 years, the anonymous collective and the rise of what we call alt-right. Do they take similar paths or are they um, totally bifurcated cultures? We are lucky to comment on all of this with one of the main experts in hacktivism in the world, and especially when it comes to Anonymous, anthropologist Gabriela Kodeman. She's also the curator of a digital museum about hackers and their culture called Hack Curio, which I strongly recommend to all of you. Uh, Biela, good afternoon uh, from Spain. Good morning for you. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk about uh, these topics today. So, mm -hmm. Just to remind you all uh, before we start that it's not just me making questions to Biela because you can set an, send us any questions that um, you want by posting, it, posting them on the sitting page. So um, Biela, I think uh, we can start this talk defining the, the name all right uh, because or alternative right that mm, it has become very popular uh, to define these collectives uh, especially in the new united states here in spain we don't use it so much but uh, you are not a big fan of this name can we explain what is called alternative right and where does this name come from so the term alt-right was in invented by a white supremacist, uh, Richard Spencer, in the early uh, 2010s. And it wasn't a term that was really uh, popular. Uh, it was really just known among a very small group of people. But around 2013 and 14, different types of groups um, and individuals who were aligned with different types of what I think of as cultural politics the men's right movement, those against immigration, white nationalists, um, they started to adopt the term alt-right to kind of um, bring coherence to what had been sort of disparate groups and concerns. Mm -hmm. And the term alt-right, again, um, then started to refer to a kind of like loose coalition of groups and individuals who had different um, interests such as fighting immigration or supporting white supremacy. But what united them was a dislike and hate and demonization of social justice politics. And they would demonize it through this term social justice warrior, SJW. Uh, there was also a big critique of the mainstream media. Two small things. I mean, the term alt-right was meant to both um, soften the very kind of ugly fascist politics of this world to make it more palatable to a wider audience. Um, it was also meant to reject mainstream conservative politics for alternative to conservatives were a different type of conservatism. Um, and journalists in the United States first adopted the term alt-right and then rightly so a lot of people were like you know this hides the very reactionary politics can we start using um, things like the far right or the reactionary rights mm -hmm. uh, we knew anonymous uh, for their actions um, their operations as they call them uh, the big hacks of corporations, the hacking of the mass media attention. They had several forums where these operations were coordinated. Um, and one way to get into Anonymous was to participate in these actions. But how do you get into the far right? Uh, is ideology the most important thing? Yeah, so um, I'm going to back up a little bit and first of all, try to kind of at a higher level explain Mm -hmm. One of the, w the ways I see the differences between anonymous and the far right, they often become a little collapsed because in some ways, anonymous image boards, 4chan and 8chan, 7chan, 420chan, there's other boards in regional places. These boards uh, were really important for the genesis of anonymous and the genesis of the anonymous uh, far right and alt right. They both use memes. They're very hard to understand. 
Um, so in, in many people's minds, they're similar, they kind of came from the same, they're similar because they came from the same place. But actually, as you noted, Anonymous, um, at a certain point around 2010, 11, 12, really got involved with hacking and social movements and social justice, and they organized themselves around operations, particular operations to fight corporations or to contribute to social movements. Mm -hmm. Now, the alt-right, far-right, they certainly um, have been involved in political protests um, and different forms of politics, such as anti-immigration politics. But if you look at it as a kind of movement, it's it's not so much a protest movement in the way that Anonymous was. It's precisely as you noted, I think, a cultural movement to change people's consciousness around certain forms of cultural politics. And one of the ways that the far right works is by trying to um, recruit people uh, into their movement and be critical of things like feminism and multiculturalism, right? Mm -hmm. So just as in, in, in certain ways in the 1960s across the Western world, you had a really strong form of cultural politics around sexuality and liberation and feminism, I see the far right and the alt-right as a very similar form of kind of cultural politics that is meant to change people's minds around feminisms and multiculturalisms and portray them not as progressive, but as regressive and reactionary. And this is an important part as authoritarian as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. And the point is to try to kind of recruit people into this worldview and change their minds about the nature of cultural politics. Mm -hmm. We couldn't cons consider uh, anonymous authoritarian in in any way. Um, wait, can you repeat that? Now, if, if you think that uh, anonymous couldn't be uh, considered authoritarian as the far right right now uh, in either way. Yeah, I mean, um, I think it's the... The far right was more kind of focused on pointing to certain cultural trends like feminism as authoritarian, mm -hmm. whereas anonymous would tend to kind of focus in on kind of particular forms of corruption um, or authoritarianism that came out of particular government configurations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, one thing that um, came in back to the, my my previous question. One thing I um, uh, we have noted about um, uh, the the pandemic movement that we have now, and this is a big problem, is the red pillion concept. Um, because um, uh, all, all these pandemic movement um, have the assertions that the coronavirus is not a true pandemic or that the virus was created as a weapon uh, as a weapon by Chinese government, or that, that the vaccine is a way to get control of your brain invented by Bill Gates. Uh, people who believe in this kind of theories call themselves themselves the, the awakened ones. Um, the rest of us are those who are sleeping because we haven't reached the, the truth yet, the truth. Uh, but before coronavirus pandemic, we were seeing uh, something very similar to this process um, process in the digital far right, isn't it? That's right. So the red pill is mm -hmm. um, a concept that comes from the movie The Matrix. Mm -hmm. And it's a reference to um, uh, basically uh, a moment or there's a kind of theme in the movie where you're either gonna take the blue pill, which is accept uh, falsehoods, or if you take the red pill, you see the reality of the world. And in the anonymous uh, far right and far right, red pilling, which was a concept that came before the kind of coherence of uh, this concept of the alt-right or far right. Uh, for example, men's rights activists would use it. Um, neo-reactionary groups coming out of a world called the Dark Enlightenment would use it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it became really, really popular in the 
far right as a concept to um, demarcate the moment, like when you are red pilled, you you demarcate the moment where you realize, oh, something like feminism is actually authoritarianism. I've been mm -hmm. red pilled. I see the truth now, right? Mm -hmm. And what is so interesting about the concept of the red pill among the far right and also among kind of anti-coronavirus conspiracy theorists is that it's steeped, as you know, in this idea of truth, awakening, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it also is really important because for two other reasons. First of all, it, it, it's like a timestamp for conversion. One day I was like this, and now I've seen the light and mm -hmm. I'm like this, I'm a new person. There's a kind of very religious sort of element to red pilling. Mm -hmm. In the far right as well, um, red pilling was a concept that an individual would use when they maybe decided, you know, I'm really against um, immigrants or I'm against feminists. And so, and, and um, there was maybe a moment uh, where they could identify where they've had enough of leftists and decide to go right. But what's interesting is that the far right would also try to red pill people. Mm -hmm. So some of their campaigns, so anonymous would have a campaign against a government. Come join us, come join this campaign, come join us and support the, the far right has become become stronger because of this conspiracy around the coronavirus pandemic. So on the one hand, it's, it's um, become more diffuse. And so far as there really was this moment between 2014 and 18, where again, different types of groups with different politics, some were hardcore Nazis, others were anti-immigration, others were men's rights activists. They, they um, agreed to kind of be under this big tent of the alt-right or far right. And what united them was their hate and demonization of social justice warriors and the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. And that was also emboldened by President Trump, right? And so there was a kind of coherence to that politics, um, or at least a focal point. I don't know if it was coherent, but there was a focal <laughs> point. <laughs> with the conspiracy theories that have been popping up today, whether with QAnon or conspiracy theories around the vaccine, um, it's, these sensibilities are more diffuse, mm -hmm. you know, they're not as focused in on a few things, but now there's more ways in, right? Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it's more diffuse, but I also think it's stronger in so far as, um, you can come into these movements and sensibilities through, um, conspiracy theories around, the coronavirus. And in, in that sense, I do think it's stronger, even if the messages are more um, multiple and diffuse. Mm -hmm. And what about Anonymous? Uh, did Anonymous enter that spiral of, of conspiranoia uh, sometime? You know, I think when you are involved in different forms of activism against governments or corporations, there's always a bit of conspiracy thinking you know, because you're trying to unearth something secret and make it known, you know? Mm -hmm. And so certainly I think that there was and is a kind of what I call conspiratorial sensibility uh, that was in the world of anonymous, like, oh, you know, we're being spied on. Um, corporations are engaging in wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, that conspiracy thinking was then connected or hinged to the data that they were able to get, let's just say through hacks and leaks and wouldn't kind of spiral completely out of control into the realm of complete falsehoods or hoaxes. I mean, maybe one small point though, to kind of transition mm -hmm. um, to thinking about the far right. One very big operation in Anonymous was called Op Death Eaters. And it was an operation that was focused on human tra trafficking and uh, pedophilia. Mm -hmm. And it was really focused on people like um, Jeffrey Epstein, who, as it turns out, yeah. you know, was involved in a big pedophilic ring, 
right? Um, and what was interesting about the operation was that it, it, it tended to stay within the realm of truth and facts, but again, kind of always, you know, pushing towards the realm of, of kind of falsehoods, right? And I think if you look at Q, the conspiracy theorists that also were really, um, had a huge foothold on the image boards, um, they're also really focused on pedophilia as well. Now, there seems to be no basis in fact, in terms of their conspiracy theories, but we also know whether it's the Boy Scouts, the Catholic Church, or Epstein, there are a lot of cases of pedophilia that were covered up for the last decade, right? Mm -hmm. So conspiracy to me is always interesting because I think that um, uh, there is so much cover-ups and, and corruption, right? And when you're in when you have a drive to uncover those you have to have a kind of conspiratorial mindset um, but then that can very easily devolve into total misinformation and lies as we're seeing in this current moment with whether it's q or the conspiracies around um coronavirus mm -hmm. yeah it's it's um, it's also inter something interesting to compare both collectives when it comes to uh, the news and how the med the media informs uh, because both collectives, Anonymous and the far right, distract the, the media. But while Anonymous collaborated with journalists from time, the far right uh, attacks them and their work most of the time. Yeah, so it was, it was really interesting when I was doing a lot of my research with Anonymous. Um, I noticed that they would often like to hate on journalists and would be critical of journalists. Um, but they would work with them. They would work with them all the time in, in the establishment uh, media, the mainstream media, boutique media. And by working with them, I mean a couple of things. They would give over the leaks to the journalists. Mm -hmm. If there was an operation, for example, to, um, to accentuate um, a case around rape, Op Steubenville, they would be pushing the journalists hey, can you just put more attention on this, right? And so if there was any critique, it was just like, you're not doing your job, do your job better, right? The far right, I mean, first of all, they have their own media sphere, right? Mm -hmm. There's YouTubers, um, there's Fox News that was often very sympathetic with their position. There is Breitbart News, which was quite big in the United States in 2014, 15, 16. And there was a symbiosis, a very close symbiosis between Breitbart News and the far right. And in fact, Steve Bannon recognized the power of these people mm -hmm. and said, we need to steer these individuals and, and court them. Mm -hmm. But the far right was also extremely critical of um, establishment journalism, mainstream news, and a lot of their energies would be focused on a couple of things. First of all, picking apart any mistakes in mainstream reporting. And actually mistakes do get made. So sometimes they would legitimately find them. But the other interesting thing is that they would sometimes try to undermine mainstream journalists by, again, uh, unleashing a campaign of disinformation that um, seemed to be true, like end Father's Day, Mm -hmm. And then journalists would report on it and then they'd be like, ha ha, you know, you didn't do your homework and we are trying to delegitimize you by exposing how easily it was to bait you into reporting something false. So a lot of their energies were focused on recruitment to red pill people. And it was also a kind of demonization of what they called the MSM, the mainstream news. And they would try to bait mainstream journalists into covering false stories to show how corrupt this, this world is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have talked uh, about the difference, differences between them, but both movements have more convergences than where it seems at the beginning. And I think one of the best examples are memes, uh, which you cite. Um, which uh, works strongly used by Anonymous and are one of the main weapons also for the far right. Uh, for both collectives, it's also very important to keep up their visual relevance, uh, this perception that uh, the so must go on. Uh, 
right? Yeah, so I mean, uh, two points of convergence are, while the far right um, has non-anonymous figures, um, whether it was people like Steve Bannon or Richard Spencer or many, many others, there was a huge base that was anonymous, especially coming out of the anonymous image boards. Anonymous with capital A was anonymous. I often describe both as being anti-algorithmic subjects. They're very hard to trace, very hard to understand. Mm -hmm. But both of them have a huge visual, very rich visual culture, right? Of mm -hmm. videos and memes with anonymous. Um, they were often tied to videos or the guy Fox Mask, which became kind of the symbol of the movements. Um, in the case of um, the anonymous far right, probably the most famous uh, mean to, to kind of help create boundaries around the movement was Peppa the Frog, um, which was not created as a as a image for the far right, but was taken by the mm -hmm. far rights. Um, and uh, both of them, like many other political movements, do rely on visual images and videos to spread their messages, to kind of recruit new people. Um, and at some level, I think there's some collapsing or confusion between the two precisely because they use memes um, so much in their domains. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I also think that, you know, different political movements of of very different kinds. If we look to, for example, Hong Kong and the democracy protests that have been going on there um, until recently, they also used a lot of memes as well, right? Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, they adopted Pepe the Frog uh, right in the period where Pepe the Frog was identified with the far right and anti-democratic politics in the United States. Pepe the Frog in, in the context of Hong Kong was mobilized as a symbol for democracy and love, right? And I think moving forward, all political movements will um, turn to this visual vocabulary of memes or GIFs, um, short videos as a way to both relay messages and, and recruit individuals. Some people are critical of memes um, insofar as they often work at a very kind of emotional level right they're not necessarily about putting forward an argument and word but about conveying a message through image um, and some people are a little skeptical of that because it's like well maybe it's easier to spread falsehoods through memes mm -hmm. i don't think that's the case i think that the meme is a handy kind of um type of visual vocabulary that can be used for, for kind of good or bad, but it's a handy mechanism by which to kind of um, spread different types of messages. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the anonymous use memes, um, that the way, the way anonymous use memes and digital networks inspires in some way, inspired in some way, uh, how far right is using them now? So I don't think that there is a, um, direct connection insofar as before anonymous in terms of the kind of um, hacktivist movement identified with anonymous came into being between 2008, 2008, between 2008 and 2010, memes were used already, right? Memes already existed. Um, for example, cat memes were probably the most famous ones to come out of 4chan and they were just used um, for fun. Professors use them for teaching. I think Anonymous helped to show um, how you could marry memes to politics, even though they existed before. But if Anonymous didn't do it, someone else would have done it as well, right? Because it is such a handy kind of visual vocabulary for portraying message messages. So in the sense that they were so visibly marrying memes with political action, they helped to put that template out into the world. 
and then the far right used it also in very kind of savvy ways. But again, I think it is a visual vocabulary that we'll continue to see in many different types of political movements, whether they're progressive, conservative, or reactionary. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, something very difficult to preview, but I, I want to know your opinion about this. Um, do you think that the, the far right will go down after Trump's uh, defeat? Or maybe it has not even reached uh, their peak yet? Yeah, I don't think they're going to go away. Um, in fact, I think that if Trump, Trump hopefully leaves office, he has lost, but it's not <laughs> clear he's leaving. Um, the kind of again, cultural politics, which is against progressive politics, whether it's against immigration, certain forms of multiculturalisms, feminisms, certain forms of supposed government um, authoritarianisms and regulation. It runs deep, it runs strong, it runs in many different quarters of social life, whether it's evangelical churches or youth cultures online. The, the trends represented by the far rights uh, will not actually go away. I think that they will continue to have momentum. And if Trump goes away, his loss will embolden people to um, push forward in spreading their cultural commitments. Mm -hmm. And I think will continue to affect the political landscape culturally and in kind of politics who gets voted into government in the next um, four to five years. Mm -hmm. I have, uh, we have some time for the last question. Um, uh, when we, when talking about the end of anonymous collective, at least the end of their most powerful actions, you have explained that uh, technology had uh, a strong influence in it because no one actual can actually be continuously updated um, to the latest innovation in, data, in digital technology. Even if you are the best hacker, if you can compromise these systems and hacking big companies and government, eventually you will get caught. But what about the far right? Do you think that technology will have a, a special role in their end? So first, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned this because while on the one hand, there were certain individuals in the far right who were technologically savvy, it actually wasn't a very tech-oriented movement. For sure, they were on image boards. For sure, they were using chat rooms like Discord, right? But again, I think their power lied in their campaigns of disinformation, um, their ability to change people's minds, their ability to shift media narratives. They were so good at that, right? So they weren't actually technologically savvy in the way that I actually think Anonymous was a bit more technologically savvy. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if people with more technological skills did become more prominent in the far right. It's also the case we're seeing something, and I don't know if this is happening in Spain, uh, but uh, certain quarters of um, these movements are moving to their own platforms. Uh, they're moving off YouTube, they're moving off Twitter, they're going to Parler, right? Mm -hmm. That will be really, really interesting to see what happens for a couple reasons. I mean, there is a way in which maybe if you're sequestered into your own domains and you're not on Twitter, maybe recruitment will be harder, right? Because you're kind of in your own corner. On the other hand, it may also embolden these groups to be more technologically sovereign and then have more power because they're able to control the technical means of production as well, right? Mm -hmm. So it's hard for me to predict what will go on um, or what will happen, but again, they are breaking away from some of the platforms as um, Twitter and other places regulate these worlds and ban uh, some of the material that's coming out of these worlds. And as they go into their own technological domains, it'll be interesting to see whether they're contained uh, 
-hmm. or actually whether they grow more powerful precisely because they have technological sovereignty, which they don't necessarily have on platforms like Twitter. Mm -hmm. So, Biela, uh, I'm really enjoying uh, this talk, but uh, we are running out of, out of time. Uh, the decision, the decision festival continues now, and we need to leave it here. Uh, thank you very much for joining us um, all the way from Canada, and I hope to see you soon. Uh, to the people uh, that are watching us, um, as I said, uh, the Decidium Festival continues now with um, a session that is called Decidium Di Dialogue Participation by Design. Uh, thank you all uh, again and uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you for having me. Bye, everyone. <laughs>